Hi. I'm Chris Chivas, the director of the American Statecraft Program here at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And I'm delighted to have with me Professor Beverly Gage, who's a professor of American history at Yale University, to talk to us uh, for the next hour about her wonderful new biography of J. Edgar Hoover. So Hoover was the director of the FBI from 1924 up to 1972. Uh, he had, this is an extraordinary half century of American history um, and a, a half century in which, you know, so many different things transpired. Obviously, we have the recovery from World War I, the Depression, World War II, and the impact that that had on, uh, on American society and on America's role in the world, the Cold War, McCarthyism, the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, and uh, also an important part of the story, just the rise of, of modern intelligence agencies in the United States and around the world, something which, which also comes out among all of these other things so clearly uh, in your wonderful book. Um, Hoover, and you said recently, just before we were talking, that he's a villain of the 20th century, and certainly that's how we remember him, although you, you provide a very balanced account, and I'm looking forward to talking to you about that. His personality is also very fascinating. Uh, and a lot of that comes out um, in the book as well. Um, for our audience, I'll just read um, how Professor Gage concludes uh, her study here because it's a good summary and also a good uh, starting point, I think, for thinking about Hoover's life and, and what, what it teaches us uh, about, uh, about America in the 20th century. Um, you write, Hoover exerted unparalleled influence over American politics and society for more than half a century as a committed conservative and as a government servant, as a single-minded bureaucrat, and as a confused, sometimes lonely man. We cannot know our own story without understanding his and all its high aspiration and terrible cruelty and in its many human contradictions. It's a wonderful conclusion to the story, but also maybe not a bad place to start. I have many things that I want to talk to you about, but you've just written this recently. Do you have any, anything that you would add to this, to that summary at this point? It, it's hard, perhaps, to, you know, to summarize a book of such uh, extraordinary depth in just a sentence, but I've, I've just done it a lot. You did it, uh, and I've just repeated it. Yeah, well, thanks for that, uh, for that introduction and for the invitation to be here. Um, it's great to have a chance to talk about all of this and to talk about it here in Washington, which is Hoover's hometown. It's the place that he's born. It's the place that he dies. Um, and in many ways, I think it really is a book that is about Washington itself. Hoover was born here in the late 19th century uh, at a moment when Washington was a little bit of a backwater. Um, and he dies in 1972 at a moment when uh, it is uh, obviously a center of national power, is become a center of global power, and in which you know, the federal government itself has been transformed. Um, the national security state has been built. Um, so it is a book about Hoover, but it is also a book about Washington, about, uh, I think, the United States as a whole over the course of this kind of incredible sweep of time when he was in power. And, and, and as I said, there, there are a number of things that I want to talk about, um, you know, uh, race, the national security state, anti-communism, uh, American conservatism in this period, um, and, and the FBI and, and intelligence. But, but maybe as a way in, I wanted to ask you if you would, um, if you're able to pick based upon the time that you've spent with J. Edgar Hoover, I mean, what do you think was his... Um, the best time in his life. What was what was the greatest moment in his own mind of this extraordinary uh, you know career that that he had over the course of well fifty plus years? That's a great question. So <clears throat> I, I, I should say in answering it, I would distinguish what he thought were the greatest moments I'm in his yeah, career I'm from, what, from what he thought. Yeah. to be clear, not necessarily what y y you think were. Yeah, and that makes me think of, of two periods actually. So one was in the 1920s. So he became director of the FBI, which wasn't called the FBI yet, but was this uh, very small version of what we now have today called the Bureau of Investigation. He became head of it in 1924, and really for his first 
decade or so there before it began its massive expansion, I think he was very content sort of building and refining his internal bureaucracy. It was small, it was tight knit, and those years were really critical for him bringing in uh, a core of young men who shared his values, shared his outlook on the world, who were, as he described it, a new breed of professional government servant. Um, and he built this own very intimate world for himself. Now, most people had never heard of him in that moment. So I think if he were pointing to uh, kind of his greatest moment of influence and really the cause of his life, uh, that would be in the 1950s when he is uh, the great standard bearer, even more than a figure like Joseph McCarthy of the anti-communist cause when uh, the country is behind him for the most part in that cause um, and in which he is uh, really in the center of the, of the Washington establishment and very widely admired actually in ways that I think we tend to forget about today because we, we tend to think of him as such a villain. And then let me ask you, so if those were the two uh, moments that he would probably consider to be you know, the most, the, the high points of his life, one in which he's really creating what became the Federal Bureau of Investigation, in which, again, another theme that comes across clearly, clearly is the extent to which, especially in its early years, that organization bore the imprint of his personality on such a deep level, and I, and I, want, to, I want to talk about that, his cultural worldview, but also certain things about his, you know, his, his interest in order, his ability to categorize, and all those things which were uh, very much part of the, the organization. Um, and then obviously, as you say, at, at the high point in the 1950s when he sort of, you, as you portray it, the, the moderate alternative to McCarthy, uh, who, who even uh, other conservatives are starting to get pretty sick of and, and, and fed up with at, a, at, a, at around about 1953 or 1954. Uh, but let me ask you the flip side of the coin, which is from his perspective, what do you think he would have said was the, the, the low point and the worst moment? So you can pick two again, if you'd like, mm -hmm. in his life. Mm -hmm. Well, all of the worst moments that come to mind have something in common, which is that they were moments when public opinion was turning on him, when the Bureau was coming under lots of scrutiny, and that was usually around civil liberties questions. So that was usually uh, when he was being attacked for you know, invading um, Americans' right to privacy or free expression, often when he had been going after the left and the left pushed back. So there are any number of them. The Palmer raids is one. There's a, there's a big blow up in, in 1940. Uh, but the one that I think was the worst for Hoover was in 1971, um, toward the very, very end of his career when a group of anti-war activists broke into a very small sort of regional FBI office in Media, Pennsylvania, and they stole all the documents. And then they began to publicize those documents, send them to places like the New York Times, the Washington Post. Um, and that was bad for Hoover for two reasons. One was uh, that it exposed what many people had long suspected, which was that the FBI was in fact infiltrating, surveilling, disrupting you know, the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, student activism, black power organizations. And this was sort of the hard proof for the first time. And the second was that the FBI never figured out who did it, so they got away with it. Uh, and that was a total outrage because he sent hundreds of agents to Philadelphia. And it wasn't very hard to know in some general way who probably had an incentive to do this, um, but it was never solved by the FBI. And it was about 10 years ago, as they were all getting, uh, getting quite old, that they themselves uh, went public. Uh, it was a great book and a great uh, documentary about that, about that moment. And you, and you point out, I mean, so this comes really in the last year of his life, right? I mean, that, um, that it's one thing for people to have you know, suspected that he was um, you know, had gone, that the FBI and under Hoover's direction had gone well beyond the, the remit of the, of the law. But it's another thing to actually, to see it, see proof of it um, and, and the impact that that had on people. And we should talk some about um, the impact that, that that revelation along with Watergate had on, on American culture and people's trust in, in the state. Because during Hoover's life, there was a fairly high degree of trust uh, in the state, and, and Hoover, you know, in part, uh, was, was you could say was was part of that. I mean, he had, there was something about the way in which 
Um, you know, he ran the FBI, something about maybe even his demeanor that gave people uh, in that era, you know, growing trust in what was a, a rapidly expanding power of the, of the federal state. Before we get into that, though, I think that just because it's such a, a broad sweep of history, um, I, I was hoping that you could sort of, we could walk through the four uh, parts of your book, not in detail, but just so that people can have a, a mental map in their minds of, of Hoover's uh, life and career. So you split it up into four parts. So the first part is 1895, when he's born, up to uh, 1924, which is sort of his early life and um, his, uh, his, his becoming director of, as you said at the time, what was known as the Bureau of Investigations. What are the, the main things that he does in this, in this early part of his life? Well, a lot of that section is about his upbringing in Washington, and I think Washington was really critical for him in a couple of ways. One is uh, that pretty unusually for the time, he grew up in a family that had a history of career government service. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the administrative state is tiny, barely yeah. exists in that moment. Um, but he nonetheless comes of age in both a family and a community where lots of people work for the federal government. And so uh, that was a pretty normal and ordinary thing. And I think in many ways set him on his life course. And the other piece that's really interesting to me about Washington during that period is that it was a deeply Southern city and particularly um, in those 20 years uh, in the 1890s up through the First World War, uh, it's a city that is actively segregating um, and is actively separating its white and black residents. Federal employment is becoming much more aggressively segregated. Um, and so I think a lot of his racial outlook, his social conservatism um, that he puts into action in the Bureau comes from those years. But in a practical sense, he grows up in DC, he goes to Central High School, uh, public school, white public high school, uh, kind of shining star of the DC public school system at that point. He then goes to George Washington University and happens to graduate in 1917 with a law degree at the moment that the US uh, was entering the First World War, goes straight into the Justice Department, kind of rises through the ranks. Uh, I think most notably gets a job as a very young man as the head of a new experiment called the Radical Division, which is essentially uh, the federal government's first experiment in peacetime surveillance of revolutionaries this was and left in the justice, in the justice Department. Yes, this right. was in the Justice Department and the Bureau, um, uh, sort of in between the two. Uh, and then he becomes assistant director of the Bureau in the early 20s. Um, and that's how he ends up uh, when the Bureau kind of melts down and the Justice Department itself, they kind of melt down in a series of uh, corruption and uh, double dealing scandals of the early 20s, the Harding administration scandals, Hoover emerges then as the director and interestingly as a, as a reformer, um, which is of course not necessarily how we would think of J. Edgar Hoover. Let me ask you, you used a term which I think some of our, um, uh, our, our participants here may be familiar with, but maybe not all, which is the administrative state. And it's such an important part of the story that you tell. Can you, you know, briefly explain what, what you mean by that? Yeah, I think the easiest way of thinking about that is that it's just the part of government that is basically made up of, of career service. So it's not uh, the electoral wing of the government, but is uh, largely in the executive branch, um, the national security state, the regulatory structures, the social welfare state. You know, most of the work that the government actually does um, is taking place over there in the, uh, in the administrative state end of things. And many of the people who tend to, to attend Carnegie events like this actually work I now thought, in the administrative yes. state. <laughs> so it's good that uh, it's a subject, because this is also a, a story. One of the many st stories here is the story of how the administrative expands uh, and, and the way in which he is, he is so effective uh, as a sort of manager uh, and, and politic, you know, uh, uh, so effective with the politics of the administrative state and how it relates to, to power in Washington and to, the, and to well, his, the executive branch, but also Congress. But, um, okay, so, so that's part one, sort of his early life, and then he's, he's, he's launched on this career in the Bureau of Investigations. So 1924 to 1945, I mean, in terms of, you know, U.S. history, obviously this is, you know, the, the, the Roaring Twenties, it's, it's our post-World War I experience, but then, of course, the Depression, um, a period where the United States uh, in its um, foreign policy and attitudes withdraws to some extent from the world, 
um, but then of course, you know, enters the world in the way that we know it today in, during World War during World War II. So another, you know, really important period in the growth of, uh, you know, the way that the United States thinks about its role in the world um, and momentous times in American history. But so what was happening for Hoover in this second period as you lay it out in his life? Well, he became director of the Bureau in, in 1924, so he was just 29 years okay. old at that point. Um, and this whole period from 1924 to 1945 really is, I would describe it as his institution building period. Um, so he spends that first decade kind of uh, reforming and redefining what he wants this bureau to be. And really, I think embracing a set of progressive ideas about expertise, about scientific methods, about professionalism. Um, he makes a big deal about the idea that all of his agents are going to be college educated lawyers and accountants now. And, uh, and so he spends a lot of time doing that. Then the 30s comes along. And one of the really interesting things to me in looking at uh, this moment is how much the FBI really is a product of the New Deal um, mm -hmm. and then the war. But the FBI actually is a, is a kind of New Deal alphabet agency like the WPA or the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps. Um, and we don't tend to think of it that way, but it's very clear institutionally that this is what happens. So there is an explosion of concern about crime in the 1930s. It's a big part of Franklin Roosevelt's um, priorities. And so uh, the FBI expands very dramatically, gets its new name, uh, begins to carry guns, and begins to become a, a real law enforcement agency, fighting people like John Dillinger during that period. Um, and then very quickly has to do uh, another turn and another big expansion because Roosevelt wants Hoover to move into domestic intelligence surveillance um, as it's clear that the war uh, and concerns about the war are picking up. And one of the interesting pieces about the FBI's story is how early that starts to happen. So there are a series of kind of secret one-on-ones between Roosevelt and Hoover, starting in really 1936, uh, in which he says, go ahead, begin looking at fascist and communist groups. You know, don't worry about uh, a variety of uh, kind of civil liberties concerns. We need to do this. The war is coming. Um, and, and we need to get control of that. And it's really the Second World War when the FBI, like so much of the rest of the federal government, uh, expands. So uh, from 1939 to 1945, it basically quadruples in size um, and then stays as this much bigger entity when the war comes to an end. And one of the things that's interesting about the fact that um, the FBI as we know it today, well, not both literally, is, is born of the New Deal is that certainly in Hoover's time, this was a conservative uh, organization by and large, um, yet obviously the New Deal is, is, a, is a social, um, progressive social uh, um, you know, moment in American history. And I think you have a line in, in, in the book about, that I don't have it in front of me, about sort of the, the alliance between a law and order conservative and progressive social liberalism of the, of the New Deal. Um, I found that, I, I found that fascinating because it speaks to Hoover's ability, and he does it again under Truman and maybe with slightly less success, but again under Kennedy to sort of navigate between uh, the different political changes that are taking place in Washington. But that's the first time that he's really expected to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the real um, sort of political puzzle of the book or the, the structuring force of the book in terms of politics uh, is that Hoover is the product of two pretty distinctive traditions. One is a kind of liberal, progressive, state-building tradition of, uh, of expertise and science and career government service that is supposed to be apolitical and nonpartisan. He's a DC resident himself, so in his entire life, he never votes or joins a political party. Um, and he really does represent that mindset for a lot of his career. And so uh, there are lots of ways in which liberals and progressives, though we would tend to forget this, back him, support him, um, and, uh, and really become part of the engine that gives him his power. On the other hand, 
uh, ideologically, he is a very powerful social conservative on issues like anti-communism, uh, on race, certainly, uh, on religion. He spends a lot of time kind of urging everyone to send their kids to Sunday school, on law and order, which he sees as kind of um, a matter of, you know, individuals being moral failures, right? Mothers who didn't send their kids to Sunday school produce criminals, okay. right? That sort of mindset. And so today we don't think about those two traditions going together, uh, right? We tend to think about conservatives as being more anti-statist, et cetera. But Hoover combined these two traditions in, in a really powerful way. Um, and as a result, was able to draw support from lots of different constituencies. But I think to understand the FBI as it emerged, you have to sort of see it at the intersection mm -hmm. of these two, which were both very powerfully held. That's, that's really interesting. And I want to get to talking more about well, a number of these things, including the FBI. But let's, let's keep, I want to keep this also moving forward so that we can have the sort of the history out in, in front of us. So the third part of your book, uh, is about, uh, covers his life from 1945 to 1960, or 1959. Um, so here we're talking obviously about, um, you know, America, the moment in which America really rises to, to global power uh, after World War II um, experiences, well, as I learned from your book, not its first Red Scare, but the, the moment that we think about uh, as the Red Scare with McCarthyism, it's the, uh, the Cold War. Um, he has uh, this, um, you know, complicated relationship with Truman, uh, but then a, you know, a very strong relationship with Eisenhower. Um, so, so again, what are the main things that he accomplishes in this period, or what are the main things that happened to him? Well, there's this moment after the war, or just as the war is coming to an end, when all sorts of things seem to be up in the air. Right? What is the intelligence establishment right. going to look like after the war? And so, uh, one of my, my favorite parts is to think about, you know, could things have gone differently? Yeah. And so uh, I have a chapter about Hoover's vision for the post-war order in which uh, he wanted the FBI as the OSS, sort of precursor of the CIA, was winding down. Hoover had a vision and made sort of a push for global intelligence to be brought into the FBI as well. And of course, as we all now know, uh, he is rebuffed by right. Truman in particular, who is very suspicious of Hoover. Um, and so that's sort of a story of things that didn't happen. Um, one of the consequences of that not happening is that uh, Hoover then, for the 40s and 50s, really focuses very much on domestic communism um, as his, uh, his signature issue, I think in many ways really uh, the cause of his life and the sort of central organizing idea of his whole worldview. Um, so that really peaks in the 40s and 50s. And there are two features of that that I think are really interesting. Um, one is that though we tend to think about you know, McCarthy and Hoover as being basically the same sort of person, you know, these devout, impassioned, outspoken anti-communists, and they were friends, mm -hmm. and they shared certain ideas, um, both Hoover himself and then the Eisenhower administration in particular uh, really saw Hoover as a counterweight to McCarthy, promoted Hoover as kind of the serious institution builder, McCarthy as the demagogue and the liar, um, and Hoover as the, as the kind of serious, dependable anti-communist. Um, and in fact, he kind of wins that battle, right? McCarthy is censured, he dies of alcoholism uh, at a moment when Hoover in, in the 1950s has uh, approval ratings in the 70s, 80s, 90 uh, percentiles. Um, and that's the second piece that I think is really a little bit forgotten about that period, which is uh, that J. Edgar Hoover was really popular. Super popular, this really comes across. <laughs> it's, 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 it's amazing to think of any public figure right now having that level of, of popular. As you said, at some points it's above 90%, if I remember correctly, which is just amazing. Um, okay, so but then just to, to move on, um, the, the fourth part of your book is um, about uh, from 1960 to, uh, to his death in, in 1972. So uh, here we obviously have the continuation of the Cold War, but it's, uh, it's under President Kennedy, with whom he has a very different set 
of, uh, of, of, of views, but we have the ongoing civil rights movement. We have this alliance with uh, President Johnson, um, and then obviously an alliance with President Nixon, but that maybe doesn't work out exactly the way that he wants. Um, and yet another, you know, of the Vietnam War, um, you know, in addition, um, you know, what do you think are the key, th what's really happening here in his life? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this is the period that most people today think about. Focus I think on. it's Hoover's, right, sure. yeah. Hoover's this is most it's famous clear, the period. When you say that he was thought of as a villain, it's really, you know, because of this period, first and foremost. Exactly, yeah. uh -huh. and I, I think there are lots of good reasons yeah. for that. Um, so, you know, one of the things that the FBI is up to during that period Although I should note, often with the sanction of uh, the White House or the Ken including Kennedy, yeah. Kennedy's Johnson yeah. um, is uh, pretty aggressive surveillance, uh, disruption, harassment, um, targeting of a whole range of, uh, of left wing groups. Although also some right wing groups, uh, particularly white supremacist groups like the Ku Klux Klan, neo Nazis. Um, so that might be something uh, worth worth talking about, but uh, that's one of the big themes of this period. And you know, it's really the moment that this bipartisan consensus that Hoover had been able to build around his work uh, during earlier periods begins to fall apart. Um, he's still surprisingly popular <laughs> in the 1960s, oh. um, but uh, as the country is becoming more divided over things like civil rights, people's opinions about Hoover really change. And as you suggested, I think, you know, the other piece that's really fascinating during this period are these incredibly complicated relationships he has with Kennedy, with Johnson, and then ultimately with Nixon. And uh, they are three of the most interesting presidential relationships in the book. So, okay. So that, so now we have a picture sort of of his life and of this, um, you know, really um, important part of the 20th century. Um, let's talk, I want to talk about uh, his anti-communist views. I want to talk about his views on race. Uh, and as I said, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, the administrative state and then also to some degree his, his, uh, his, his, um, his person, who he was as an individual. Um, but let's start with anti-communism because you just said that this was sort of at the core of his, uh, of his beliefs. I mean, what, what was his thinking about communism? Why was it such a, a, a terrible threat uh, to him? Uh, one of the reasons that I got interested in writing this biography is that I was writing another book uh, that was about a terrorist attack on Wall Street in 1920 that was suspected of being left-wing radicals, anarchists, revolutionaries. Um, and that's actually where I first encountered Hoover in the archives. And he was there as a very young man helping to investigate this, but was the head of the radical division, which I mentioned earlier, which he was appointed to run. Mm -hmm. his, in first, his first job. In the, in the, his first the real job, exactly. And, uh, and that was in the moment that the communist parties were first being created. It's right in the wake of the Bolshevik revolution. And what was interesting to me was that I could see his ideas forming in that moment. Mm -hmm. And I could see the way that, you know, what a, what a 24, 25 year old is thinking about in 1919 and 1920, as the Bolshevik Revolution has just happened, then goes on to shape so much of, uh, of, the, of the course of the 20th century. Um, and so I think for Hoover, you know, communism was this gigantic category that had lots of different ways in. So one was just a national security question right. in the most basic ways, right? Soviet espionage, particularly in the 40s and 50s, there's a lot about kind of new information that's come out in recent years about Soviet espionage, some of the big cases in the book. Um, he also is very suspicious of the Communist Party as an institution, and particularly as an institution that has uh, is getting money from the Soviet government, um, is uh, particularly in the 20s and 30s, you know, sending people back and forth to study at the Lenin School, but as a kind of domestic subversive organization. And so he puts a lot of his energy into watching the party, infiltrating the party, all of that. Um, and then he thinks about communism also uh, in much broader terms as a kind of great existential struggle that affects everything in American life. You know, race, religion, 
Uh, he doesn't like you know, lots of liberals and progressives because he thinks they're too soft on communism. Um, and so nearly everything that he touches, I think, is in some ways informed by uh, what he sees as you know, the both practical and uh, sort of existential struggle of the 20th century. And um, it's hard to find anything he does at the FBI that isn't in some way you know, informed by that worldview. And it, it's, it's another thing that was interesting to me is that you, you recount some of the other um, ideologies, in particular fascism, that he did focus on to some degree, especially in the later 1930s, in trying to collect information and conduct surveillance about the, the American Bund, is that the name of the fascist party that uh, he was following? Um, but then after the war, perhaps because you know, Germany is defeated and there's a sense that fascism is defeated, there's communism is sort of what's left for him uh, as you know, to the definition of anti-Americanism. And yet there is, as you account, you know, a fair amount of activity going on. Uh, um, you know, how much of it was really threatening to US national security is a question, but there was certainly a lot of activity going on in those early years. So he almost had confirmation of this view and then it, it directed his, his whole idea of his life's mission. Is that, is that about right? Yeah, I think that's right. And he already had lots of ideas about you know, why one wouldn't like communism um, before mm -hmm. that moment in the 40s and 50s. Um, but the beginning of the Cold War is such a moment of, first of all, you know, widespread concern about these questions and of kind of the ability to put those ideas into, into action. And one of the pieces that uh, was really interesting to me about those moments was being able to see a little behind the scenes about what Hoover believed that he knew that was being kept secret from other people, um, right? So some of these big espionage investigations in particular, but then also to see um, in espionage investigations, you know, decryption projects, the fact that you could get a little information but not all the information, uh -huh. just what that kind of did to the mindset, not only of Hoover, but of the Bureau, knowing that you've got, you know, you know and can identify 4% of the Soviet Union's espionage agents in the United States. So where are the other 96%? Who could they be? They could be anyone. They could be everyone, right? And so in some ways, that little bit of information uh, was incredibly dangerous uh, in its own right because it could, uh, you know, lead to these to these vast expansions. Do you, do you think that he was paranoid in this sense? Is that what you're saying? I mean, there's a certain element of exaggeration in his mind because he had enough to imagine a much worse situation than than, than reality. Yeah, I think it's somewhere at the intersection between total paranoia, which is often what his right. critics accused him of, saying yeah. there are no Soviet agents, yeah. right? And uh, the fact that there were some, and he knew there were some, and the question was, you know, just, just how many are there? Uh, and so and it's they a- start turning up, and, and so he, you know, <laughs> exactly. how big is this problem? It's, exactly. it's the, uh, uh, the, the known unknown, I guess. Um, okay, let, let, me ask you, let me ask you one more question about the anti-communist. So just to be clear, you, you talked a little bit about the relationship with McCarthy, but I think it's important to understand because before I had read this, I sort of lumped Hoover and, and McCarthyism together. But it comes out in here, as you were saying, that you know, Hoover was, um, was and was certainly viewed and used by Eisenhower as the, almost the conservative antidote to McCarthy. Is that, is that correct? And if so, can you talk a little bit more about it? Yeah, that's right. So Hoover is doing this work much earlier than McCarthy. And though McCarthy looms very large in our imagination, he's actually not a significant player for all that long. You know, he makes his, his big famous speech in Wheeling, West Virginia in 1950. And by the end of 1954, he's basically being, you know, he's become persona non grata in the Senate um, and, uh, and the Eisenhower administration, as well as a lot of his colleagues in the Senate have turned against him. 
Um, but Hoover is there much earlier, um, and many of the kind of famous episodes of the Red Scare happen long before McCarthy comes into any power or influence, and they're much more engineered by Hoover. The Hollywood Red Scare, uh, the prosecution of the leadership of the Communist Party, the Alger Hiss case, uh, to some degree the Rosenberg case, right? a lot of these kind of famous moments are all pre-McCarthy, but they're very much in Hoover, and Hoover is building a huge apparatus um, around the anti-communist cause. Uh, he's there in the 50s when McCarthy comes along, and as I said earlier, they're, they're friendly, and Hoover does do some information sharing with McCarthy, but um, when Eisenhower comes in especially, he really allies himself with a, a, a more conservative, and more state-based approach to thinking about mm -hmm. communism. You know, he's going to be his professional fact-finding agents are going to tell you who you need to worry about. Whereas Joe McCarthy, they're saying, is like a, is, is a demagogue. He's out of control, and Hoover actually works to bring McCarthy down. And then once McCarthy is gone, Hoover continues to push ahead with anti-communism, and his big worry becomes that the country is going to forget about anti-communism. Right. And so there are a number of programs that come about in the moment after McCarthy, Hoover's big bestseller, Masters of Deceit. Mm -hmm. uh, Which the is a book he published in 1958? Or yeah, or exactly, because uh, he wants to keep the issue right. alive. And anyone who was around at that time and in these circles, inevitably, if you were a kid, someone, someone tried to push Masters of Deceit on uh -huh. you in yeah. your school, in your uh -huh. church, in uh -huh. your Boy Scout troop, whatever it might have been. Uh, this is how he starts COINTELPRO. And it's also how he uh, you know, begins a, a whole series of new, new initiatives. So he's there before McCarthy. He helps to bring down McCarthy, but also works with him. And then he, he outlasts McCarthy. And you mentioned COINTELPRO, and I want to talk about that. That's one of his most famous surveillance and uh, uh, programs. But I want to go uh, first to, to, to race, which is also another theme that comes through this whole, uh, this whole story. I mean, uh, you know, Hoover was a, was a racist. Uh, and he starts with that, his view on race very, very early on, as you say, comes out of the culture of Washington, D.C. as a southern uh, in, uh, you know, uh, city, but also in, is is a member of you know Kappa Alpha, right? So could you talk a little bit about that and, and how his racial views play out um, over the course of his career, both in his management of the FBI and then also obviously when it comes to civil rights uh, and his complicated role in civil rights in the 1960s. Yeah, Kappa Alpha was one of the most interesting. I guess, discoveries uh, in doing my research. So I had known that Hoover was a member of Kappa Alpha, but I didn't understand what Kappa Alpha was until I began to look into it. This was his college fraternity that he joined when he was at George Washington University. The fraternity is still uh, around the country today. Uh, but it had been founded in the aftermath of the Civil War very explicitly to kind of carry on the cause and the culture of the white South, the memory of Robert E. Lee. And when Hoover joins it early in the 20th century, um, it is a really very explicitly Southern, explicitly segregationist fraternity. One of its most famous members on the national scale, an alum, was a guy named Thomas Dixon, who was a novelist um, who wrote the novels that became the basis for the film Birth of a Nation, which came out in 1915 when Hoover was in college um, and was a film that championed the Ku Klux Klan uh, and uh, is a famously uh, racist film. So what was interesting about Kappa Alpha is that I could kind of build out the world in which Hoover acquired his racial outlook and he, rem he remained... Um, pretty actively uh, involved with Kappa Alpha for a long time. And one of the premises of the book is that he, when he became director of the Bureau in the 20s, sort of built it in the image of this fraternity that had meant so much to him. So both in terms of kind of bonds between uh, fraternity brothers and wanting to have this very tight-knit, college-educated core of white men, but also in its cultural outlook, its racial outlook. Um, so that's really the core of what he holds on to for 
most of his career, and I think it's important in two ways. One is uh, the ways the FBI itself develops. So he is very determined to keep his agent corps, in particular, white. Um, he resists at many, many moments any attempt uh, to uh, calls to bring black agents in. Um, and it has a really profound you know, cultural and institutional effect on the FBI itself to be built in this vision. Um, and then there's the question of what the Bureau is doing for those years, and particularly uh, where you hit an intersection of black activism and radical activism. Um, it's clear that you know, those people black revolutionaries, radical activists, civil rights activists, uh, were the people that Hoover thought were the deepest threat to the nation and were also the people who absorbed um, so much of the FBI's repression, uh, cruelty, kind of extreme abuses during, uh, during the Hoover era in the 60s famously, but, but in some earlier moments as well. So let's talk a little bit more about the 1960s because that's really the key moment. Um, and, and, and in some ways, you know, there's my sense from from reading your the, the chapters on that period is that his obsession with race is part of what drives him. You know, over the over the edge, his you know um, fixation on MLK, for example, um, his uh, almost reluctance to deploy the FBI um, in support of. Um, of civil rights in, in the South. I mean, ultimately he does it because I think it seems like he felt like he had to because Johnson had asked him to do this. But it's, it's a complicated relationship. But I mean, talk a little bit more about how it plays out in terms of his actual policy uh, decisions, his, his actions in the 1960s. Yeah, I think the King material was really fascinating because it is uh, sort of a study in the ways in which all of these factors are are coming together in in a in a truly outrageous way. So a lot of his initial interest in King was in a, a couple of advisors and colleagues of King's who had been uh, in the Communist Party and had in particular been in the secret apparatus of the Communist Party. Um, and it seems pretty clear, unlike what many people thought for years, that that was in fact true, um, that the FBI's uh, interest in these two figures, you can say, well, that should have been a benign enterprise. I mean, you can have your opinion about it, but um, those two figures were in fact, uh, I think, pretty involved, uh, certainly in the 50s, and then that there was still some overlap between the period that they were uh, working within the communist orbit and, and the period in which they were working with King. So that was sort of the national security way into looking at King. But what happens under the Kennedy administration and the Johnson administration is that um, that logic uh, just grows and grows and grows. So what was first a sort of national security investigation around the communist question then expands um, to be conducting surveillance of a variety of King associates. Uh, Hoover gets mad and it steps this up when King uh, criticizes the FBI. Um, he becomes even more upset when uh, civil disobedience becomes one of the most effective tactics of the civil rights movement because he sees that as a defiance of law. He, of course, is doing all of this through this highly racialized outlook. Uh, and if you look at his memos on King, the FBI's memos on King, uh, they have very exaggerated views uh, of, uh, of King's sexuality, of a whole series of kind of racist tropes through which they're thinking about why this man is, is dangerous. Uh, and this all really peaks in, uh, in 64, 65, when the FBI is not only uh, wiretapping King, but actively following him around the country, sneaking into his hotel room, uh, planting microphones in the lamps in the hotel rooms, uh, and at that point, capturing some of King's extramarital sexual activity, taking that material, um, trying to use it to discredit King in the press, um, and I think most, most famously, uh, recording some of this, sending it to King himself along with 
um, an anonymous letter that is, is trying to uh, kind of threaten him and uh, push him out of American life. Um, and many people think trying to urge King to, uh, in fact, commit suicide. Uh, and that happens, right, from a, from a small national security investigation, a serious one, but pretty contained. Uh, that, was, that happened over the course of about four years. Um, they're bugging his hotel rooms. And some of it he justifies as doing a service to President Kennedy and to President Johnson that they need to be aware they're developing a closer relationship with Martin Luther King and they should be aware of his alleged communist you know, ties uh, and, other, and other behaviors. Uh, but really what's driving, he's just obsessed. He just becomes obsessed with this. Um, and it's hard not to explain it as, as you know, largely driven by his, the views that he had from, from his youth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and with Kennedy and Johnson, I think there are also these fascinating moments, right? We think of them as the civil rights presidents. Um, and in many ways, that's true. Kennedy comes a little late to it, but he gets there uh, in, in 1963. And then, of course, 64, 65, uh, Johnson backs uh, the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act. Uh, but both of them are also in these sort of active conversations with the FBI, not only about surveillance of King, but of the civil rights movement more broadly. They're getting lots of political intelligence from FBI surveillance. Um, and Johnson famously, you know, just a couple of months after he has uh, championed the Civil Rights Act, uh, actually gets the FBI on his request to set up a special squad for the 1964 Democratic Convention um, in which they are uh, watching and reporting to him several times a day about uh, civil rights activists who, uh, in particular, a group called the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, just trying to challenge uh, delegates from, from the white South. And so Johnson... <laughs> It knows exactly what the FBI is, is doing to King, at least in general terms, um, and makes use of them in, in all sorts of ways. Just in a period that comes across as a period of extraordinary overreach. I'm, gonna look, I'm not looking at my phone. I'm looking at questions. This is how we get our questions here. Um, okay, so this is a good uh, sort of changing gears a little bit to go to, to, to think about, um, you know, his... Uh, how he built the FBI and then how he managed it um, with such success in terms of you know, strengthening the organization, at least in a bureaucratic sense, uh, over the course of so many decades until this period where things start to run off the rails in the 1960s. I mean, what do you think were the keys to his ability to, you know, to build this you know, extraordinarily powerful uh, agency within the US government? How did he do it? I think we have a popular image of Hoover, which is that he did it by, you know, gathering dirt in his files and then sort of uh -huh. strong arming everyone in Washington. Um, and there is some truth to that. Uh, that is part of what he was doing. And again, particularly in his later years when he had the ability and the power already to do that. But I think in many ways, the more interesting story is kind of the range of bureaucratic strategies he had that allowed him to survive under four Republicans, four Democrats, and to really build out the FBI. So some of it was this kind of championing of um, a kind of professional career government service mindset, both within the Bureau and then... Which we take for granted today, but it was, it was more of a, a new thing then, is that correct? Right, I mean, it yeah, was something uh -huh, yeah. that kind of had to be invented. Right, yeah. um, and, you know, in the late 19th century, you're beginning to have glimmerings of a civil service, uh, but it's really in the early 20th century that those ideas spread and take off, um, and he becomes one of their standard bearers. That said... And this was fascinating to me and would probably be interesting to anyone who's sort of been inside, you know, the, the D.C. bureaucracies. He was adamant that he did not want his agents in the civil service structure. Um, by a quirk of history, uh, they were not subject to civil service rules. And so Hoover was adamant that he wanted to be able to hire and fire his agents as he wanted them to be, and that he didn't want any pool of you know, qualified civil service applicants. He just wanted his own guys. Right. And it's one of the reasons that the FBI 
beginning in the 30s has such a distinctive stamp, right? We know what an FBI agent looks mm -hmm. like, right? The tall white guy in the suit with the shoes, and the, right? That is partly because Hoover was so good at uh, managing the bureaucracy. He was good at public relations. He was incredibly good at congressional relations. In fact, again, for a DC audience, one of my favorite parts of the book was in this moment in the 40s where congressional committees are beginning to get professional staff and they need professional and staff. Putting his own people on it is brilliant. Exactly. I mean, you know, he thinks yeah, about which you know, committees uh -huh. are important and, uh, and he sends both FBI agents and, uh, and also ex agents to go staff all of those committees. He's like, You need investigators? What do I have? I have investigators. And so it gives him this way into the Appropriations Committee, the Judiciary Committee, House on American Activities, Senate Internal Security, all of them, they're just staffed by FBI agents. Um, so he had this range of, uh, range of talents. He was a good file keeper too, right? <laughs> that actually really, really mattered. That was sort of mine for cate categories, dividing everything in category A, B, and C, you know? So you knew which, uh, you know, pile to put the file card that he was collecting on a particular individual into. But he also, there's almost an autocratic mind uh, behind him as well. I mean, his, you know, real need for orderliness, um, you know, you talk about his Presbyterian background, Swiss background. Um, you know, his interest in, in the military as a cadet, even though, uh, you know, his military service is not a big part of his life. But I mean, you know, he almost reminds me, there's a moment in the book where you're describing how personally he takes infractions on bureau rules. It reminds me almost of Frederick the Great. I mean, sort of this, you know, desire for bureaucratic control in which the autocrat at the top of the system is just imposing his own view on the, on the world in a very systematic way over the whole organization. Yeah, and I think a lot of that is because, you know, the FBI sort of grew in fits and starts. There weren't a lot of uh, outside accountability mechanisms. Um, and Hoover's own personal energy and vision was, as you say, uh, very top down, but also um, very controlling. I mean, he's a very tightly wound figure, right? right? And there are these, uh, particularly in the early years, but extending through his whole career, right? These kind of funny memos that are like, you have left your galoshes under the desk, right? This is a, an unthinkable infraction. What will people think if we cannot have an orderly office? How can we enforce law and order in this great nation? I mean, uh, uh, and that was a lot of his ethos. And you know, I think a lot of his employees ultimately um, admired and respected him and found him to be a, a, a tyrant. And, and in many ways, um, he got in the way of the work they, they really wanted to do sometimes. As, as someone who's worked in the Pentagon uh, and seen the reality of, you know, all the hardworking people over there and the conditions that they live in, the idea that you would get in trouble for leaving your galoshes under the desk uh, is, <laughs> is amazing. Um, so we have, a, we have a, another question here from a, a scholar in our program, uh, Chris Schell, who, who is interested to, to know a little bit about um, COINTELPRO and in particular how he used it to disrupt uh, activist groups in the 1960s. So we touched on this a little bit, but we didn't quite get into it. So first of all, tell us what was uh, COINTELPRO and, and, and how, did, um, how did Hoover use it to, to go after some of these groups? COINTELPRO, I think is the, probably the most notorious program of Hoover's tenure now. But at the time, outside of uh, you know, the, the White House and Congress, there was, there was some information sharing there, um, was not known uh, as a formal program during his lifetime because it was largely secret. But it stands for Counterintelligence Program. And what the FBI meant by counterintelligence was not just surveillance or you know, gathering information for prosecution, but was active disruptive measures aimed at organizations that it basically didn't like. Um, so that meant anonymous letters, it meant sending informants into meetings to disrupt things, uh, it meant spreading rumors, publishing fake press reports. They even appeared to have some, some like cartoonists on staff at the FBI to make cartoons, making fun of various activist organizations, right? So a whole range uh, of, uh, of disruptive measures, some of which are you know, kind of funny to look back on and others of which are really very dark, uh, dark and serious. 
Um, so a lot of COINTELPRO was aimed at left-wing organizations in the 60s, the Civil Rights Movement, the Black Power Movement, one of the most extensive and infamous, and I think uh, cruelest, was aimed at the Black Panthers um, during the very late part of the 1960s and early 70s, Puerto Rican groups, the anti-war movement, the New Left. Um, and there were a couple of things that were interesting to me about the FBI's techniques in thinking about, you know, how do you disrupt a social movement? And some of what they were trying to do, as I said, was really truly nefarious, but others was based on uh, what I thought was a pretty astute analysis of the places that a variety of social movements are often vulnerable. So they would send informants in with instructions to make the meeting really long and really boring and to ask a whole series of irrelevant questions and demand that they be answered in the meeting. Right. So anyone who's ever been in an activist setting <laughs> knows that, in fact, that's what kills movements. People don't <laughs> want to be in those meetings. And so uh, they would do things like that or, you know, sowing rivalries between uh, the leadership factions of a given organization, um, you know, most famously uh, with Huey Newton and Eldridge Cleaver in the Black Panthers. Uh, but they were doing this with all sorts of organizations. And so um, that stuff was interesting to me that their understanding that, you know, it was factionalism, loss of energy, et cetera, that could really kill a movement. Two other things I'll say quickly about COINTELPRO uh, that I think are not as well known as uh, these campaigns against the left. One is that it started out, I mean, like the King investigation itself, it started out in the late 50s as a program aimed at the Communist Party in particular um, in the aftermath of Khrushchev's speech um, about you know, Stalin's crimes and Stalin's legacy that was creating all sorts of internal disorder in the Communist Party. And uh, that led the FBI to think this was a moment when if we can accentuate all of that from within, the organization's gonna fall apart. Um, and so that's a lot of the origins is this very particular context. And then it spreads. Uh, the other piece that was interesting was that while most of it's aimed at the left, there was a, a program called COINTELPRO White Hate that actually was applying many of these same techniques to the Ku Klux Klan, uh, to a variety of other white supremacist groups, to neo-Nazi groups and vigilante groups on the right. Um, and you might think, well, how does that fit with Hoover's worldview? But he saw a lot of those groups as um, being dangerous because they were using violence, and in particular because they liked to thumb their noses at federal law enforcement, federal authority, and uh, and he wasn't going to put up with that. One of the things that I that I like about your your book is that even though it is it, it is ultimately a critical story about J. Edgar Hoover, it's also fair in a lot of ways, and you see you get all of the many different angles of what you yourself say is a very complex. Individual. I mean, you said that Hoover himself is, you know, was very intense, <laughs> um, also very restrained uh, in some ways. Um, you know, how would you connect his, you know, his his Hoover as an individual, as a personality, as a character, to all of these broader uh, themes that we have been talking about? Well, he really comes of age in this moment when uh, this idea of self-restraint and self-discipline is kind of one of the central ideas that's being taught to young boys. And when you see what he's reading and the environments, the church, the school in which he's coming of age, uh, the idea that you have to exert control, you have to exert discipline, you have to restrain your own impulses and emotions and all that, that's very much core. Uh, I think to Hoover's being for the rest of his life. It's how he runs the Bureau. You know, one of the big questions that many people have is about his sexuality. And I, I write a lot about that in the book. And that too is a funny combination of, uh, of openness and uh, kind of publicness and then deep repression, restraint and secrecy. Um, he had this lifelong uh, relationship with Clyde Tolson, who was his second in command at the FBI, but also essentially his social partner. I mean, they traveled together. They went to nightclubs together. 
Uh, and they were really regarded in Washington in particular as a social couple. So if you were having a dinner event and you were gonna invite Edgar, you invited Clyde and they, and they came together. And that was pretty widely accepted. Um, so there's a very uh, open relationship there and yet for a variety of reasons, uh, of course it's not acknowledged by Hoover or Tolson or uh, the community at large as being a gay relationship. We obviously don't know what they were doing. Uh, in the bedroom. Um, but they spent, they spent their vacations together. They were, it's an interesting work relationship in a way because not only did they work uh, you know, hand in hand, but they also spent all of their private time together. So just regardless of whether they were straight or gay, it's an interesting relationship uh, in and of itself. But those parts of the book are parts where it's hard not to feel some empathy for this figure. And that's one of the things that I like uh, about the story. Let me ask you, since we're about done with time, a final question that I always like to ask uh, authors, which is, what was your favorite part about writing the book? Oh, well, I am a document nerd, you know? <laughs> and so uh, I think it was coming across, you know, these little uh, glimmers in the FBI documents themselves, and I didn't know where they would come, uh, but of, of Hoover himself kind of coming through. So he doesn't have a lot of personal papers. Um, you know, there's an endless amount of paper that came out of the FBI itself, um, but partly because Hoover never expected these documents to be able to see the light of day, he often wrote these little notes in the margins. Mm -hmm. um, so I got to know his handwriting and would come across uh, these little notes where he's making, you know, very sort of sarcastic comments or um, is talking about, you know, what a jerk this other guy is and those sorts of things. And so that felt like my most unfiltered access. And it was sort of fun because you didn't know as I was, you know, methodically slogging through half a century's worth of a bureaucracy's papers um, where these little glimmers of personality would come out. Well, thank you, and, and, and thank you for writing this book. I think this is going to be the, the, the biography on Hoover for a long time to come. Thank you for coming to Carnegie to talk to us about it. It's been a, a real pleasure. Great. Well, thanks. It was a lot of fun.